Merciful Father, on this beautiful Sabbath morning, we pray to you to give thanks for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us throughout the week and throughout this morning, and for the opportunity that you give us to once more open up our eyes and to breathe that air and to be able to rest on the Sabbath and to be able to sing these hymns and to be able to hear your word once more. We thank you, Lord, because you have never left us, because you give us the instructions that are needed for us to live in this world that is full of wickedness, full of malice, and full of sin. But we, with your instructions, we understand how we need to live our lives so that we may receive the blessings that you will give to all those who are faithful to you and who do what your will is. Lord, we ask that you give us understanding and give us wisdom as we study this lesson and that you open up our, our hearts and our minds so that this lesson and the instructions and the objective that you're trying to teach us this morning can enter in the, into us and that we may accept it and treasure this, this lesson and that we can Use it to continue living our lives as best as we can in your eyes. Lord, we ask that you bless all of those who will be watching the service and that you continue being with us throughout this day. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved brethren, in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, peace be with you. 
So it's another great Sabbath and another opportunity to study the Word of God. Another lesson, and this time around is actually the last lesson of, of the booklet that we have been studying for uh, this uh, couple months. And so this lesson, uh, it's called Seven Women Shall Take Hold of a Man. The objective of this particular lesson is to know the meaning of this parable to value God's protection of the people of Israel and to know that we can be part of that same privilege if we keep the commandments. So, uh, once that said, we do have a scripture reading, which I'll be reading here in a bit, in Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. So let's get our Bibles ready and start reading this portion of the reading. And it says as follows. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, the mighty men and the men of war, the judge and the prophet and the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty, and the honorable man, the counselor, and the skillful artisan, and the expert enchanter. I will give children to their princess, and babes, and babes shall rule over them. The people will oppress every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child will be insolent towards the elder, and the base towards the honorable. When a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have clothing, you be a ruler, and let these ruins be under your power. And that day he will protest, saying, I cannot cure your ills, for in my house is neither food nor clothing. Do not make me a ruler over, ruler of the people. For Jerusalem stumble and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. So, in, in this particular reading, we find that God is talking to the prophet so that he can speak to, the, to his people. More specifically, to Jerusalem and to Judah. That's where Jerusalem was located after the separation of the kingdom of the ten tribes to the north and two to the south. Um, as we have read through uh, this booklet, there are many prophecies that were given. One of those prophecies, uh, in this case, is this one directed to Judah. Uh, because of their moving away from the Lord, God basically saying, you are going to have all of these things happen to you. All of these things that uh, you did not expect will happen because you moved away from me, God is saying. And so, in that sense, after that happened, we have to remember that the idea uh, behind many of the symbolisms that we see in the Bible are meant to give an explanation in a much easier way for us to understand. So uh, the people of Israel, Judah or Israel, um, however you want to uh, establish that, it, uh, they are represented as a woman. In this case, uh, when we look at the memory verse in Isaiah chapter 4 verse 1, we see the following. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. So, in this verse, uh, we complete what was happening or what is happening uh, through Isaiah chapter 3, or the prophecy that is given to Isaiah about Judah. So Judah moves away from the Lord. Obviously, they get punished. Uh, God allows for the neighbors of Judah to uh, come, on, come upon them and defeat them, to treat them badly, and so on and so forth. We also have read 
um, about Judah, how they're taken captive to Babylon, and so on and so forth. So there, there is uh, things happening to Judah. One of the things that happens is that uh, as a representation of Judah in these uh, seven women that are talked about in Isaiah 4.1, is that they would like to have the name of a husband, the name of someone. We have to remember that during those times, and even in certain parts of the world, uh, a a woman, if is if she is not married or or she doesn't have a rep, a male representation, she does not uh, she does not get the respect that she needs. And so, in this case, when we're talking about these seven women or seven um, ideas, in this case, uh, if you will, uh, obviously there is more of people and how they want to live their lives. So what they're saying is, you know, we want to do our own thing. We want to eat our own food. In this case, uh, we want to be fed uh, any any form of information, any way of doctrine or anything, that's uh, how we want it. it. We want our own thing. Uh, we want to dress the way we want to dress. In this case, to do what we want, not having someone to tell us what we can and cannot do. Um, one of the things that we see as a comparison is the commandments of the Lord to stop us from doing so many things. We can look at the Ten Commandments as a basis. Uh, for instance, uh, God says that we should not have any images to idolize. Uh, it also says what the day of the rest, what is the day of rest for every one of us. It tells us that we should not uh, commit murder, uh, that we should not steal, we should not be adulterous, we should not covet, and you know things like that. We should not lie to our neighbor and so on. Uh, obviously, there is more that we have to consider that are part of our daily lives so that we can find grace before the Lord. But these women uh, do not want to do that. They want to be called, in this case, on the men's name, or in other words, uh, with the people of God. They wanted to be called the children of God, but they wanted to do their own thing. It's almost like having our own kids that carry the, the last name but really never carry out the customs, the, um, the teachings that the parents uh, gave them. Uh, they start uh, picking up other things um, through friends, through acquaintances, and so on and so forth. So the idea here is that Judah, um, in this case, moved away from the Lord saying, we want to be called the people of God. We want to be called children of God. But at the same time, we don't seem to like the way those rules are. We want to do our own thing. So God prophesies against them, saying that if you do that, you're going to be punished. So just to, a little background, uh, you, we may see, okay, what does uh, Isaiah 4.1 have, have anything to do with what we read in Isaiah 3? Well, the background to this is that most of the scrolls, if not all, um, in actually all the, the scrolls that were given by God uh, as, as far as the content of whatever's in those scrolls to the prophets, was never divided in chapters or verses. That was later done by a certain individual to make it easy for us to look at the Bible, look at references, find things and to be able to move through the reading easy and, uh, and just uh, just so that you know we all have uh, something to to distinguish uh, a certain portion of a story to another uh, obviously as people uh, we we tend to do the best but in this case uh, who, uh, when the division of the chapters for Isaiah uh, were done specifically for this prophecy. Obviously, they broke it. They broke it in a, in a way that they separated the explanation 
of a continuous reading from chapter 3 and, and on. So chapter 4 verse 1 is still part of the same story that is given through Isaiah 3. The story that we're reading or the prophecy that was given to Isaiah about uh, the people of Judah. So it was one single script or one single role that was given to Isaiah, but they're still the same, uh, the same word of God in following that sequence. So the prophecy that was given, again, it was directed to Judah, the people of God, the Jews, if you will. That, that scripture or that prophecy was to be fulfilled within them, not anybody else. And the reason we say that is that there are some interpretations in certain people that those seven women that we see in the Bible, uh, they reference that that man is Jesus Christ, even though he is, but in essence, this wasn't directed to him uh, in the Gentiles. But it's mainly talking about God. Uh, it, it is that man is God and the seven women are the Jewish people or the people of Judah. Um, there is the application to our Lord Jesus Christ as also being that man, but it's not referencing the, uh, the Gentiles as being those seven women. But there is uh, people that take this particular account and they say, well, those seven women are the different denominations of Christianity that uh, are around the world. That they claim uh, to be Christian, uh, but they do their own thing. They are followers of Christ, but only to the sense of his name, but uh, do not follow uh, what Christianity is. Now, it can this teaching be applied to that? Yes, it can. But the direct implication of the story wasn't meant to cover the Gentiles, but it was meant for us to understand what happened to the people of God, to the people of Judah or the Jews uh, as it is today. The descendants of all of those that God called his children. Now, in, in a sense, even though many disobeyed and many of them do not follow God's commandments, they will be judged differently than the, us Christians now today. But still, this prophecy or this reference, uh, what happened to the people of God, is still true today to them. Um, although, like I said, the teaching can be applied to us as Christians, but it cannot be uh, said that that prophecy was directly speaking about the Gentiles. We have to understand that uh, as is it, when the Jews started moving away from God's commandment, doing their own thing, turning to paganism, and doing all sorts of things that went against God's will. Obviously, that's where God said, well, I'm not going to be with you anymore. And again, the, the imagery that is used is the God is the husband or the man, and the people of God are, in this case, the women or the wives. Um, in this case, seven women is still, even though there is a, a, it's a good number, it's not saying just one, but seven, um, is still talking about the same people. It could be um, different ways of uh, looking at things. Uh, many references we can find in the Bible is how uh, during Jesus' Jesus' time, uh, the Jews were divided in, in many different forms or, or uh, factors or groups, if you will. Uh, we have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, then we had the priesthood, uh, the sea lots, and so on. Uh, there were many Many of them that were around, and they, they had different ways of thinking. Now, uh, when it's talking about Judah, obviously, maybe some of these groups were not around. But the idea is that probably the way they thought about the Word of God and how they applied it to their own lives 
was there, uh, different, uh, different ways of interpretation on their own part. And maybe that's where those seven women, if you will, come into play. But the scripture does not tell us anymore other than it is talking about the same people. When they say they want to uh, have their own apparel, again, once uh, uh, you dress a certain way, you're identifying yourself with who you think you are. For instance, if uh, you're a person that usually you know, uses uh, apparel that um, really identifies you as a runner, you know, without telling anybody, uh, people would say, well, he does exercise, whether he runs, walks, or whatever. Um, if you cover, you know, your body uh, with, uh, all the way um, and not showing any parts of your body, then people will say, well, he's probably modest, um, very conservative, and, and so on as well as whoever dresses uh, showing a lot of part of their skin even uh, closer to their you know their private parts they, they will label that person as provocative and uh, probably you know even uh, worse um, uh, without saying any words but you you would know uh, what people would say about someone that hardly uh, puts anything on to cover their their body parts so again apparel is something that identifies you and and in uh, in the Word of God when we talk about perils about actions it's about what we do that identify who we are Christ uh, said a couple of things about that is that we will know uh, a tree by its fruit obviously if we go to um, a tree um, the uh, apple tree we're not going to find pears we're not going to find grapes or other things but apples um, same thing with a different tree that has a different fruit uh, you're not going to have a fruit that is opposite to what it produces so again that's what the reference is and when we talk about what water is um, or food in this case is how you feed yourself, is the doctrine that you take in, is what you believe and where it comes from. So the food that is given by the men or God is what uh, Judah ha should have um, had allowed to go into them to, to make them obedient. But they said, no, we want our own food, meaning that we'll, we'll apply our own interpretation of what we want to do, considering you know, what's around us, whether it is the Word of God, whether it is the beliefs of uh, the the pagans around them, or even something that you, they invented uh, to follow. So uh, that's what it means. Now, there's a, a few other interpretations, and I'm just going to say another one that the lesson book covers, is that there are some people that take uh, what uh, Isaiah 4, 1 says, that seven women uh, would take hold of a man to imply that a man can have seven wives as if it was like uh, permission or something that got allowed directly for people to be able to do that have seven women as wives now in uh, the people of God obviously there were there were sev uh, several people that we can see that had obviously more than seven women as wives uh, some had four some had two and so on and so forth but if we consider uh, what the word of god says for instance when the pharisees came to jesus about uh, divorce and how that implied that they could get rid of their wives for just simple things and then marry somebody else this is what he had to say. So we go to Matthew chapter 19, um, verses 3 to 6, which I'm going to read. Uh, consider what Jesus Christ is saying. What he is implying about marriage. Is it more than one wife, two wives, three wives, four wives, or even up to seven wives? Well, let's look. Uh, Matthew 19 verses 3 to 6 says as follows. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it 
lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall, leave, shall, shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they, no, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not men separate. Amen. So if we look at this reading, obviously the Pharisees are, are talking about, you know, uh, divorcing uh, their wife just for any reason. He goes into the details about what marriage is. He does not uh, go and says, well, you know, you can divorce one of your wives or you can join in matrimony with more than one wife. He goes back to the beginning where he says that he made them male and female and those two would become one. Two become one. Not three, not four, not five, six, seven, or eight become one, but two become one. So uh, the idea of some people taking into consideration that uh, that verse is allowing them to have more than one wife obviously is incorrect. Now, there is uh, throughout our reading, again, is telling us about how the people of God, again, would uh, become uh, a distinction of two people. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 65 and other parts of Isaiah and even the other prophets, you would see that there's always that reference of those who obey and those who disobey. So when we talk about the these seven women, Obviously, we're talking about those women that do not want to be part of a marriage where they're hold to a certain responsibility. So we're also talking about in reference to the Jews or the people of God that didn't want to follow the commandments of the Lord. So that group is basically the ones, the rebel, the ones that cause in general the punishment for uh, the whole nation, for the whole people. They wanted to do their own thing. They did not want to, to be part of the, the group that obeyed. We can see that right away. When, when the people of God came from Egypt, we have to understand that there was only a certain amount that wanted for that uh, the bull, that calf, to be built of gold that Aaron help out to build, to create. And they're the ones that uh, started feasting, celebrating, saying, these are the gods that brought you, Israel, from Egypt, which was not the case. Those are the ones that perished when um, Moses came down the mountain and saw that they, they were basically becoming idolatrous. So... Again, those are the rebels, those are the disobedient, and those are the ones referenced as those seven women here in Isaiah chapter 4. They, uh, the ones that once they were told, again, that there was going to be a Messiah, they didn't believe. Um, we see that in John chapter 1 where it says that Jesus came to his own, and his own did not accept him. So, but the ones that did accept him, he made them the children of God. So, we again, we have to understand that it's still talking about the same people, the people of Judah, the people of God. It, the prophecy does not Im imply that there's any Jews involved within those prophecies. Yes, uh, we Gentiles become part of that group that accepted Jesus, but that's afterwards. So you have to remember that Jesus came to the lost sheep of Israel. So uh, those women represent the unbelievers. 
the ones that didn't want to be nurtured by God's word. And we find in, in different places that uh, in the Bible how God wanted his people to accept it. For instance, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 16, and we're going to read a few verses here, um, 10 to 14 to be exact. Ezekiel 16, 10 to 14 first, and then we're going to go to uh, a couple other verses after that. It says as follows, I clothe you in embroidered uh, cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorn you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel on your nose, earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen, silk and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor which I had bestowed upon on you, says the Lord God. Amen. So, as you can see, this is referencing how the people of God came out of Egypt. And so, God uh, basically clothed uh, Israel with, made them beautiful. Uh, when it's talking about all of these things, it's talking about protection. It's talking about giving them the commandments, giving them a, a way of life that they could have enjoyed if they obeyed his commandments. They, they were an envy for the people around them. Why? Because they could all, always um, ask God for anything and he will be there to give it to them. The only thing that God asked from them was obedience. But now let's look at Ezekiel 16 verses 15 to 16 and see what happened to them. Even though they were giving the, given the protection, they were given everything that they needed and everything else that they wanted, if, uh, if that was the case, if they obeyed, God would give that to them. And Ezekiel 16, 15, and 16 says as follows, But you trusted in your own beauty, play the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. You took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself and played the harlot on them. Such things should not happen nor be. So you can see here, they had everything that they wanted and they could have, but they were not happy with the, hus the husband, uh, with the man that help them from being poor, from being left, uh, you know, hurt, uh, to be abandoned. God picked them up, gave them everything. They were even better than royalty. They took, uh, in this case, all that was given to them, and they used it to, to sin. In this case, the, uh, the Word of God emphasizes harlotry, uh, emphasizes idolatry, obviously, with that, when uh, they started associating with uh, different nations around them. So we do have to understand that God gave them uh, a lot of the good things that they could enjoy, but they basically, this, they wanted to be, they wanted to do their own thing. They didn't want to be part of anything. God even uh, gave them an opportunity. For instance, when we look at what Zechariah chapter 3 says about referencing Joshua as a representative for the people, Zechariah chapter 3 verses 3 to 5 says as follows, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the, filth gar uh, the filthy garments from him. 
and take and to take he said see i have removed your iniquity from you and i will clothe you with rich rich robes and i said let them put on a clean turban on his head so they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the lord stood by so here we see that uh, when they came out in this case to the lord or they were before the lord joshua is a representation of the people obviously the, he was clothed with filthy garments meaning that uh, he was carrying the sin of the people but god wanted them to be uh, clothed with you know clean garments rich robes he calls it here and in other words they were cleansed out of their sin they were given an opportunity but they did not take advantage of it instead they focus their ideas on doing the opposite of God wanted so when we look at our clothing we have to understand that there is a particular situation where we are going to be distinguished on what we do again our clothes are our actions or the way that we live or the way that we uh, carry out our lives if we are clothed also uh, it references the mercy of god on us uh, for instance, let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 2 to 4 as, as a reference. And it says as follows, For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. So the other application of uh, being clothed or having to have clothes given by God is that he gives us a blessing. He gives us something new, gives us something that will distinguish us. So... Uh, here Corinthians says that we are uh, the followers of Christ and those who obey God's word we are desiring a, a new habitation or new clothes upon ourselves and those clothes are the ones that are going to be a life or eternal life so that this mortality or in this case the way of life that we currently have uh, in our bodies that suffer because of illnesses and and everything else it, it's going to disappear but we have to remember to be able to receive those clothes we have to obey so going back to that same reference isaiah 4 1 the women did not want to be clothed by the men they wanted to wear their own clothes corinthians says that we as Christians or followers of Christ, we are waiting to be clothed by God. Not that we want to clo clothe ourselves, but we want to wait for those clothes to be given to us. So the same way, those women basically were saying, we don't want to receive whatever you, God, are given us. We want only your name, in this case, be called by your name, uh, children of God, but uh, we don't like your commandments. We don't want your commandments. They're too strict. They're too, I don't know, antiquated. They're too old. They're, they're just not good for us. Uh, your doctrine uh, is, is not good. We'll make our own, uh, in this case, our own food. We'll make up commandments. And those are the things we do find in, uh, in many places. And... And the reason that I say that those uh, things that when we're talking about food, like water and bread, it is talking about the word of God or the doctrine of God. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 2 
And then Amos 8.11, it says as follows. I'll have both of those verses back to back. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass. The teaching of God as rain or as water, and whatever God says, as distill as the dew, as drain, raindrops. So again, the word of God as water. Uh, Amos 8.11 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So here we find that the famine on the land, which can come because there is no water, there is no bread, says that it is going to be of not being able to hear the words of the Lord or the word of God. So the bread here is also the the way of how God references as as a image or as a representation of his word. He uses the bread as something that represents his word of God for us to be able to understand a bit more when it is supplied in the story as as we have uh, read currently so these women um, wanted to have a husband or wanted to be married but did not want the responsibility that came with it they wanted to uh, do their own thing uh, which is unheard of um, Today, I mean, in a marriage, there is always that responsibility for, for both men and women uh, to do things jointly, not one do their own thing and the other one, another one as if, you know, you weren't married. I mean, it's, it's difficult to explain that, right? So today, and as it was then, the people of God or the Jews, uh, they invented a lot of things. And what I say invented is that they created uh, certain things to supposedly make their lives better. But it, it is not the word of God. It was only their intention. For instance, let's uh, remember when the disciples of Christ, they, uh, they just came by and they started eating, right? And then the Pharisees, one of the ones that were always there to try to find a fault on Christ and his disciples, said, you know, why do your disciples defile, you know, the traditions of the elders? Not the commandments of God, but the traditions of the elders. And they say, because they don't wash their hands. Okay, and, and, and how does that, you know, cause any particular issue? Well, they had created commandments that they made it seem more important at times than the Word of God. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 21 to see what Paul is referencing here when he talks to the church. It says, Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. Uh, and it says the following, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. So it is, and essentially all of this, it it's everything that is said before this is do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, as many other things. Are those doctrines and commandments of God or of men? Obviously, they're of men. But it says the following. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in the self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So, when we talk about, you know, how important it was to wash your hands seven times, as 
you know, the Pharisees were saying that the disciples of Christ should have done before they eat, as opposed to maybe once. Well, it wasn't. It, it was just them creating something that would probably, on their mind, said that it was better. You would cleanse yourself even more and so you could eat and nothing uh, going into your digestive system would be unclean, which uh, that's not necessarily the case. Even Christ, you know, uh, rebuked that teaching saying, well, those are commandments of men and not of God. Uh, and so what we have to understand that that's what was some of the things that were happening during the time of Isaiah. And so that's why, you know, that reference, seven women would take a hold of a man, but they would like to feed themselves and clothe themselves instead of allowing for that man to take the responsibility of giving all those things for them. So today in society, uh, we find almost the same thing with the same people of God, the Jews. Today, obviously, they don't have the temple, they don't have the priesthood, they don't have the things that they had in the past. And so, it makes it even more difficult for them to comply with God. That's why there's a lot of things that they, they still continue to create to emphasize that they're religious. But they're, instead of applying what they can do as people of God, they go ahead and start bringing in traditions from other places. Um, how they celebrate the Passover, how they uh, celebrate the other feast of the Lord, how the commandments, they imply many other uh, teachings that go with it, and so on and so forth. Instead of just going to the basics of what God is wanting for them to know. Today, what is the teaching to the church? You know, we went through... Uh, the reading, the application of that reading. But for the church today, uh, again, even though it's not talking about the Gentiles, but we can do a certain way in application. Today, we do have the commandments of the Lord, and we also have the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who did accept the Lord, those Jews, those uh Israelites that accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they're the ones that are called, you know, the church of God in the beginning, during the time that, you know, after Christ died. <clears throat> we are part of that group. We are part of those, uh, of that women that did accept the husband, that did accept the rules. Today, we, the church, are supposed to follow the same example of those who began uh, to carry out the Word of God. But today we almost see the same implication of those who call themselves Christians. Just as the people of God decided we want only the name of God for us, but not the commandments, many will claim to be Christian, but they don't want to follow God's commandments or the examples of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many denominations, there are many people with many traditions, and if you look at those traditions and how those are relatable to the Word of God, we find that they're not. They go against it at times. They, they would be called paganism, they would be called anything else other than obedience to the Lord. We have to be careful. So the teaching that we get from that, going back to the objective, is that we need to understand this parable. We need to understand how God protected the people of Israel <clears throat> and how we could be part of that same blessing, the same privilege. And how are we going to do that? We need to keep the commandments. We have to obey God. And to this day, if we haven't, we are probably part of those seven women who take hold of a man. We are probably uh, simulating the same consequence that those women had, which was punishment, which was rejection from the Lord. We could be rejected by the Lord if we 
decide to do our own thing, if we decide not to follow God's commandments. So I hope this lesson, brothers and sisters, uh, helps us to start correcting our faults, start moving away from sin, and to take this example of the people of God and not to repeat it in our own lives. If we become uh, those people that accept our Lord Jesus Christ as, as our Savior and God as the Almighty from whom all the things come from, then we should obey His Word. Not those traditions that can move away each one of us from that blessing of eternal life. Again, I thank you and hope that you can join us again in a, in a separate service from in the next Sabbath. And may God bless you in all your lives and throughout the time that he gives you on this earth. My brothers and sisters, peace be with you. away the pain and my suffering he set my feet upon the rock my heart is filled with praise a song of praise to our god then he will see and fear the lord they'll put their trust
Heavenly and Merciful Father, we want to thank you once more for giving us the opportunity to study this lesson and to study your scriptures and to study your word, to understand how we must live our lives if we want to achieve that uh, eternal salvation, if we want to receive that crown of justice that you have promised to all those who are faithful and strong until the very end. Lord, we want to thank you for this time, and we ask that as we continue the Sabbath, that you place your spirit in us so that we may rejoice uh, as we continue singing these hymns and as we continue studying your word. We want to thank you, Lord, and we ask that you bless all those who were able to watch this service and that you also bless those who will watch it throughout the week um, when they have time uh, and that, Lord, the these teachings and these instructions that you give us um, this morning through your scriptures, that we find them useful and that we apply them to our daily lives so that we can receive more blessings from you, Lord. We ask that you bless us throughout the week, Lord, that you bless our jobs, our studies, that you bless our families and our loved ones. We especially ask, Lord, that you Place your healing hand on all, all those who may be sick, whether they're sick physically or mentally or spiritually. We know that you are the one true God and that nothing is impossible for you, Lord. So, Lord, we ask all these things and give you these thanks in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.